Let me read that. For God alone, my soul, waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a, le a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse Selah. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be shaken. O oh God, rest my salvation. Uh, on God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in Him all, at all times. O oh, people, pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are delusion. In the balances they grow up, uh, they go up and they are t together light, lighter than a breath. Put no trust in exhortation. I'm sorry, put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hope on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. Now, I call this God our haven of rest, a quiet solace against the power of man. Uh, it is one of those psalms that scholars, another one of those psalms that scholars really struggle figuring out what is the context. And you'll see the superscription really doesn't give, give you any context. It just says it's a psalm of David and that it's to the choir master. Uh, and so we really just don't have. Now some have argued that this was written during the uprising of Absalom, David's son. And that would, you know, make a lot of sense. It seems to, the tone of this would fit that, but there's no historical allusions there. I mean, there's nothing in the psalm that could connect it to Absalom's uprising. There's nothing in here that connects it to running from Saul uh, or really any other historical event. There's just, it is a, almost a standalone psalm um, <coughs> excuse me. It's a psalm of confidence, a psalm of uh, hope. Um, some have said it has some of the uh, characteristics of a lament. I don't really see that. Uh, I see it more of a psalm of hope, a psalm of faith and trust and confidence in God's salvation. So I'm not really seeing the lament part, but, uh, you know, some have argued for it. But what, what you really see in here is it's a prayer of silent confidence in God's deliverance right in the middle of serious threats. Uh, it, so David is talking about some terrible things here. I mean, there are, there's reasons to panic, you might say. And yet David says for us to do and that he is going to do something that's radically opposite of what we would tend to do. My mind immediately goes to the people of Israel uh, standing on the, sea, uh, the edge of the Red Sea, and the people were in panic because the Egyptian crack troops are on their way, and, no, and Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. To me, that, that pictures in event form, the mentality of this psalm. It is a stand still and see the salvation of the Lord psalm. And if, you know, all of us have lived long enough that we have been in situations where we just wanted to pull the panic cord, you know? And we, we, we know how hard it is to go through dangerous and painful and difficult times with silent, peaceful resolution. That is not an easy thing to do. And 
when we, we, we've all lived long enough to know that when we see someone doing that, it garners a lot of respect from us because we know how difficult it is. And so this is what David is doing. And so he says, I would say, first of all, <coughs> he says, wait silently on God against injustices. Now, I think there's some application in this psalm beyond the radically personal aspect of it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But David's part, part here is obviously very personal. And you and I would most of the time apply this in a very personal way. We would feel threatened in some way, whether it be from Satan or from real enemies uh, or through circumstances. Um, they, uh, and, and we would need to reassure ourselves in God. David's talking about actual enemies. He's talking about people who are doing wrong against him. And he says, he says in verse 1, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Shaken. You know, in other places, the scripture says that the fear of man brings a snare. It's, it's, it's easy for you and me to miss how being afraid of man can pervert our way of thinking. Uh, it can cause pulpits to not preach the word or to change the word. It can cause churches to put away the Bible. Or to twist the Bible. Uh, it can cause Christians to sin and do things that they know to be against Christ. We remember Peter when he was in the presence of some uh, legalistic type people from Jerusalem. And Peter refused to eat with the Gentile believers while those guys were in town. What is that? That's the fear of man. And Paul says in Galatians, I rebuked him to his face for this. If you remember, Peter's the one that had the vision of the sheet being let down. And inside of the sheet was all these kinds of animals. And the voice said, kill and eat. And he said, I won't do it because they're unclean. And God says, whatever I've made, don't call it unclean. And the point of the vision was that they needed to stop seeing Gentiles in this way. And that they needed to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So Peter, not only is Peter going against gospel commands and the example of Christ who took the gospel to Gentiles as well as Jews, but Peter's going against the, the revelation dream that he had from God. By doing such a thing. That's the fear of man. On and on we could go about the fear of man. The fear of man can, can be a problem even in you know, our homes. It can be a problem. Uh, you know, it even tells in Peter. He tells the wife to obey her husband. But without any trembling or fear. So in other words, the wife's respect for her husband is not to be a cowering respect. It's not to be because she is afraid that she's going to be hurt. Because that's not God honoring. So what does that say for his leadership? It shouldn't be threatening. It shouldn't be that way that she would feel that way. And therefore she should not look to him with that kind of fear of, and so forth. But no, the fear that she's to give her husband is one of looking up, of respect, of admiration. And he's supposed to respect her as uh, a fellow heir in the gospel of Christ. So there is this real love and real respect. So the fear of man is a terrible snare. 
And it can affect every part of our life. And so David, you know, we all, we can all see that, but you don't really live it until you're faced with the fear of man. Until you're faced with a person or the power of man, whatever, and whatever form that might be. And you have to decide, will I fear man or will I fear God? You know, the, the apostles were faced with the authorities, the religious authorities, who told them, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And the, and the apostles replied, whether we should obey God or man, you decide. You see, there it is. There's the fear of man versus the fear of God. And so... And so David is faced with uh, injustices from vicious enemies in verses 3 through 4. He says, um, how long will all of you, and we don't know who the you are, okay? It could be the people uh, who support Saul. It could be the people who support Absalom. This could be some situation we don't know about. Uh, I mean, when you're a a king, there are people that want you gone. So this could have, we don't, we don't know where, but, but anyway, there's some people who are attacking David, okay? How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall and a tottering fence? So in other words, Apparently, they see that it affects him. It, it hurts him. It's difficult. He's a, he's a leaning wall and a tottering fence. When you see a leaning wall, what do you think? It's going to fall. It won't take much to knock it down. You walk up to a fence and you shake it and, it's, and it totters back and forth. Nothing to take this fence down. We just pull it right out. That's what David is saying. Notice David is waiting silently upon God. But how does David see his own strength? Not only is he not fearing man, he's also not trusting himself. Do you see that? He's referring to himself here as a leaning wall and a tottering fence. David realizes, I don't have enough strength. I can't fight this battle. I'm not enough to win for God. Only God can win for God. That's what David is acknowledging here, the, the humility that it takes. And notice they attack, they batter, they tell lies, and they curse him. He says they only plan to thrust him down from his high position, which is probably to remove him as king, which that's probably the statement that makes people think that it's referring to Absalom. But it's just not quite enough to nail it down. I mean, honestly. And they take pleasure in falsehood or lies. In other words, they're lying about him. And they bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. So there's a two-faced, a, a double crossing going on. So these, these are probably, when I, when I see that, makes me think these are people either in his court or in the upper echelon of Israelite life. These are people that David interacts with. And they're nice to his face, but then they just try to destroy him behind his back. They curse him to his back. And so this is what David is dealing with. We've all dealt with stuff like that, haven't we? But notice, he said, when what is that? That's an injustice, isn't it? It's an injustice. We, and he says, I wait silently on God against injustices. And I think some ways, um, <coughs> I said I was going to apply this a little less personal. I think there's a sense in which believers in our day need to get off the, the crusade for social justice and, and, get, and realize that uh, not that Christians shouldn't vote or be good citizens or any of those things. We need to do all those things to our power. But it is not the gospel's call for us to reform 
the lost world and to rectify all injustices. That's impossible. We are in a fallen world. It doesn't matter how well Christian, how much powers Christians hold in government. It does not matter how much money Christians have. It does not matter how much influence they have politically or globally. They will not get rid of injustices in a fallen world. It is, it is a fool's errand that Satan tries to put us on. Now, I'm not saying we don't help the poor and the sick. And we, yes, we do. In the realm in which we're able to do that, our neighbor, our community, when we have a vote, we cast our vote. We do what we can. But to leave the work of the gospel to chase social injustices is to do Satan's errands. I'm convinced of that. And it is nothing but the social gospel repackaged for a new day. Our calling is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. As if the first century did not have social injustices. The early church were the object of the social injustices. God's people have always been the, the object of social injustice. The early church was mostly slaves. They were mostly the poor. That's exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's exactly what James says in his epistle. He says, Paul says, there's not many noble among you. There's not many wealthy among you. Not many wise among you. Why? Because it demonstrates the mighty power of God. James says that he repeals to his readers as most of them are laborers. And so, so much so that James condemns those who own the fields and own the, the, the land. And he says, God will judge you for holding back the wages of those who work for you. The early Christians were the poor. They were the ones being done wrong. And yet, the early church did not go on a campaign to try to change the Roman Empire. They preached the gospel. And they lived the gospel. That didn't stop them from condemning it and saying, you know, like Paul, like James says, and now realize, if you treat the poor this way, you will meet the Lord of the universe someday. And he'll deal with you. You know. But what was the result for Christians? What did he tell Christians to do? Patiently endure the injustices. To honor and respect those who were over them that persecuted them. And so there is this wait silently on God against injustices. And he says, but, and why? Because God alone is his defense. In fact, uh, Dr. Kyle Yates said this. He said, the key to, to the serene confidence in this passage is probably tied up with the Hebrew particle ak, which occurs six times in the brief psalm. Three times at the first word of a stanza. The particle may be translated surely, but, better, only, or alone. So six times the writer, David, uses this word alone. Alone. Notice it. For God alone. My soul waits in silence. David's not looking for help. He's not looking for the cavalry. He's waiting on God. He alone, verse 2, is my rock. See, this is that idea. David says, my trust is not in the help of man. My trust is not in my own abilities or strength. My trust is in God alone. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, listen, king, you can throw us in this furnace. I'm giving you the Scott paraphrase, okay? Is that all right? <laughs> he says, listen, king, you can throw us in this, in, this, uh, in this furnace, and we may burn, but we won't bow down to your God. Now, if you read that passage carefully, you'll see these guys were not expecting the miracle 
that just hap that happened to them. They were expecting to be thrown in that fire and to be burned to a crisp alive. But they said silently and, and patiently and confidently, we have no power against this, but we will not bow down to your gods. And they were prepared to be burned alive. It's God in his sovereign power said, oh no, it's not going down like this. Not this time. I'm going to make a point here. And he saves them in such a miraculous way. And God can do that. And God does do that. Daniel and the lion's den. The people of Israel leaving Egypt. You know, over and over we see the miraculous deliverance of God against incredible odds. Against, you know, what we would consider to be many times uh, useless odds. I mean, that, that they would be able to, to be saved out of such a situation. Who, who gets thrown into a den of lions? You know, one guy said it this way, Daniel wasn't in the, the lion's den. Daniel was in a den of lions. You know? I mean, you know, I guess it is a little bit of a nuance, you know, but, uh, but it's true. They didn't throw him into a hole with no lions in there. He, he got thrown in with lions. And uh, I love that painting. I can't remember the, the artist, but it shows Daniel standing there. And the, sun, the rays of sun are coming down, and they're, they're coming down on Daniel. And he's standing there serenely. And around him are all these lions just sleeping. And I just like, I love that painting. I mean, that is so powerful. You know, that the next morning they're like, Daniel, did your God save you? And Daniel says, I'm here, old king. I'm here. That's God. God is his rock. God is his salvation. God is his fortress. God is his refuge. Notice he repeats those terms. Rock, rock, rock. Refuge, refuge, refuge. You know, fortress, fortress, fortress. Salvation, salvation, salvation. I think he's trying to tell us something. Don't you? So wait silently on God against injustices. Then we see wait silently on God and do not set your heart on the help of men. Verses 5 through 10. So David now, he's kind of made his case. But then he takes on this role of the king, the, the, the teacher, the leader. And so he begins to expound to the people. You know, to trust God and not to trust in the power of men. Let's first of all, just for a second, this is a king. You know, most kings want you to trust in them. They, most governments want you to trust in them. Most governments want you to think that they have the power to solve all your ills and make everything go away and give you everything you need, and, don't they? But here... We have David who is saying, don't trust in the power of men. And that is the truth. And so he says, we wait silently on God and do not trust or set our hearts on the help of men. And so, and notice he does say that in verse 5. You see, the, you see this um, repetition. Verse 1 for God alone my salvation waits in silence. From Him comes my salvation. Verse 5. For God alone, my, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. It's almost word for word the same thing. But they unpack in two different ways. So verse 1, he is, this is his personal testimony. And then verse 5 uh, to, down to verse 10 is him applying this to the people and encouraging them to do the same that he's doing. He reassures himself uh, or states his belief again for the people, for God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only, that word only, is the same word alone. So you see it's, it's, it's repeating this idea. God alone, God alone, he alone is my rock. And my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. They're shaken again. Did you see that? 
So he's saying, I, he's, this is the second time he said, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. Verse 7, O God, on God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock. He's not saying he's mighty. He's saying God, the rock, is mighty. My refuge is God. So he's distinguishing that from man. My refuge, my place of safety, is not man or myself or my own know-how, but it's God. That's what, that's what he's saying. Uh, verse 8, trust in him at all times, O people. So, so you see, that's what he's doing here. He's transitioned now to teaching. He was declaring his own personal faith. Now he's saying it to the people. He's saying, um, trust in him, trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him, which would be prayer. God is a refuge for us. So now it's broadened. It's not just David. It's all the people. <coughs> Excuse me. Put no trust in extortion. I'm sorry, uh, back up. I didn't I missed, skip verse 9. Those of lowest. So he's, he's saying, trust God, seek him, or in other words, pray to him for help. Now he's going to give you the other option. Okay? And what would that be? To trust in your fellow man. And so he's going to show us that whether they're wealthy, or of low estate. They're both of no help. They're both like a breath of air. They're both weigh nothing in the scales of eternity. They both have no power to do anything because we're going to see there's a reason why they actually have no power. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Those of low estate are but a breath. Now, a lot of times we would, make, we would easily say that. We'd say, oh, yeah, the poor people have no power. Those of low estate are but a breath. That's a pretty easy one to give away, although there are many that take their refuge in poverty. They take their refuge in the low of state. In fact, we live in a day now of what many uh, observers of culture will say, reverse snobbery. So there was a time when everybody, you know, they wanted to be high culture. They wanted to get educated. They wanted to live in a really nice house. They wanted to dress well. They wanted to be well educated. They wanted to appear cultured. That was the goal. If you were poor, then you wanted to do the best you could to climb out of that and climb as far as you could up into the culture. But see, things are reversed now. Most of the, the people in this world today, they don't want to be cultured because they see that as snobbery. They want to be uncultured. You see, have you noticed that in our culture? Even those who have money, even those who have education, they don't look to high culture oftentimes. They look to rock singers and movie stars and and, and the streets and all of that. They'll even talk like street people and they use terrible language and, and, and terrible grammar and all that. When they know better, they've, been, they've already been educated above that. But why do they do this? It's the reverse snobbery. And so, and that's, you'll see a lot of this in our culture today. Uh, um, and I'm not arguing for one or the other necessarily. I'm just saying that there are those who will take refuge in the lower culture as well. And then there are some that want to take refuge in those with power and with money. And that's what he's saying here. High estate. They have means. They have influence. They have resources. And so it seems that these would be the people that we ought to look to for help. And that's what he's saying. Don't Put your trust in that. It doesn't matter where they are, whether they're a low estate or a high estate or low estate. He says, don't, don't put your trust there. 
And uh, don't place your hope in low men. Don't place your hope in high men. Do not place your hope in wealth, period, or the lack of it. But here he says pretty much uh, wealth, period. And how do I get that? Well, follow me there. He's verse 9, those of low estate, those of high estate, and the balances, they all go up. And the balances, they all go up. So if we have a balance, a fulcrum, if we were to take their spiritual weight, their power, and we put it on one side, what are we going to put on the other side? The problem? Or God? What's going to happen over here? It's going to go up. Because it's light. They're lightweight. That's what he's saying. They're lighter than a breath. And then verse 10, put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Now here's what you need to do, or what we need to do to understand this passage. Low estate, high estate. And then robbery, extortion, increased wealth. They're, they're each other. That's what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? This is a Hebrew parallelism. The lower state equals extortion and robbery. Okay? High state equals increased wealth. Okay? So that's what he's, that's what he's telling us. Don't put your in your hope in either one of these, crime or wealth, whether it's ill-gotten or not, it doesn't matter. Don't put your trust in these things because ultimately they're weightless. They, they can't do what we really need done. And then lastly, the weakness of man and the power or the strength of God, verses 11 and 12. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. That power belongs to God, and that you, to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to man according to his works. Okay, so the first thing we see here, what do we rely on? We rely on God's word for meaning and comfort. He says, once I've heard God say this, we wonder where you heard that. Anybody? Where did he hear that? Did you see what he said? Let's read it again. Once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to the Lord. Once I have heard it, God speak this, where did he hear that? From God. From God's word. You see what I mean? We hear it from God's word. Most of us don't hear God you know, only a few have heard the voice of God. He's talking about the scriptures. In fact, some translate this, uh, the oracle, or in other words, the prophecy, the word of God. So rely on God's word. He says, I've learned it. I've heard this once from God's word. Twice have I heard this, uh, which is a kind of like a, uh, a, a proverbial way of speaking, Okay. We might say a similar type thing in English when we're fussing at our children. If I've told you once, I've told you a <laughs> thousand times, you know, we call that a, a, like a colloquialism. You know, this is similar to that in Hebrew. It's a, it's a way of saying it. I've heard it once from God and twice have I heard this. So in other words, it's got three witnesses. Did you see that? It's established. It's established. The truth is established in three witnesses. I heard God say this one time, and I've heard it twice. From a, you know, so in other words, he's saying this is a true statement. This is a true statement. He says, so apply, uh, rely upon God's word. Rely, re, rely upon God's power. What did he hear? What's the true statement? Power belongs to the Lord. This is why these are all, both like a breath, or weightless, powerless. Why? Because all power 
comes from God. So it looks like Pharaoh has all this power, but does he? No, he doesn't. You see, this is why low, high, it doesn't matter. They're weightless. All power belongs to God. So if God wants us to be defeated or my enemies to win over me, then God, God will allow that. If God does not want that, then it doesn't matter how much power they have. God will stop it. All power belongs to God. And then so what, then what do we do? Because God has all power, then the next two things are the result. And that is, we rely upon God's mercy in the covenant of Christ. He says, in you is steadfast love. That's the covenant. So what's he saying? If I want help, I go to God. Because in God is his steadfast love, his covenant in God. And guess what? You say, well, God, I believe you'll help me. But I want justice. I want to see the world corrected. Don't you? I believe God puts that in us. We long for things to be right. We long. We hunger and thirst for righteousness, don't we? But notice where that comes from. For you will render to a man according to his work. Not only do we look to God for mercy in the covenant, we also look to God for justice to be served. Now, that doesn't mean we don't vote. doesn't mean we don't obey laws or if we're policemen, we, we don't arrest the criminals. It doesn't mean any of that. But it, what it does mean is this. Until God sets all things right, all things are not going to be set right. Ultimate justice will come from God. God will give to every man according to his work. I can't do it. You can't do it. There are children who were abused, who, who grew up, lived their whole life, married, had children, and will go on to glory or to whatever their end is, and nobody ever gave them justice for what was done to them. And if you take that situation and multiply it a million times on every kind of level, there's the scale of injustice. Is there any courtroom or any government or any denomination that could ever fix that? No. Only God. But mark it down. He will fix it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you that we can rest in your hands and trust you for all power belongs to the Lord. We rest in your mercy and we trust in your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.